All right, our next speaker is Dr. Geraldine Wright, Jerry Wright, a professor of entomology at Oxford University in the UK. And strangely enough, she'll explain why she doesn't have a British accent, but she has been highly involved in honeybee nutrition and honeybee health. And so a big round of applause for Dr. Geraldine Wright. Good morning. It's a nice Saturday morning. Hope everybody's caffeinated. Um, this isn't going to be my normal sort of, let's try to cram a lot of data into one. I have the rare opportunity to actually talk about myself a bit in this talk, so I will give you a little bit of my history. It, it's a bit odd. I'm a, an American, and I grew up in Wyoming, and I am now living in the UK, and I'll tell you a bit about this, this journey as an academic. So that's me, and this was last October in the Natural History Museum at the University of Oxford. And this is my lab group, the core lab group, my students, my PhD students, and my postdocs, and a few of my technicians. This was a very happy moment for me. It was a big deal in my life to have had this day. And I'll give you a little bit of insight into what's happening in this photograph later in the talk. It's a really beautiful place, an Natural History Museum. It's got a long history, as you might expect. And I'll tell you a bit more in my talk. That's me, the beginning of my academic career. <laughs> the first day of kindergarten. <laughs> I didn't know what was in store, but I was really keen to go to school. I loved it ever since. That was in Wyoming. So uh, both my parents are from Wyoming. Some of their parents were from Wyoming. Wyoming it was one of the last states to be made a state. It was only made a state in 1890. And because it was the first to allow women to vote, it was given the name the Equality State. And the reason that they allowed women to vote in 1890 was that there weren't enough people in Wyoming, the Wyoming Territory, to actually make a state. So they had to include women in order to get enough people to have a state. And we're also, I think, one of the first to have a female governor. And we were the first. So it, it has a very interesting history, Wyoming. And my family's history is, is also a part of that. Another interesting thing about Wyoming is that it also has the fewest people still in the whole of the U.S. So it's the least populous in the 10th least densely populated state. And it's still that way <laughs> because it's not a very nice place to live in some ways. The wind, especially where I'm from in Casper, the wind blows constantly in winter and it's lovely in summer. Also, I think the oil and gas industry is our biggest thing there. And the people there have tried to keep any other industries out. So this is uh, my trajectory. I grew up here in a very isolated place. I was a pretty good student in high school. I worked really hard. And I was keen to get out of Wyoming as soon as possible. <laughs> so unfortunately, though, I didn't have the funds really to, to leave the state, even though the thing I wanted most was to go to UC Davis. So I applied there. I got in, but I just couldn't afford to go. I did have scholarships to the University of Wyoming, so I went there. And I went there to study botany. I decided that I wanted to work in botany because I liked plants, I liked plant physiology, and I also wanted to do something that was going to change the world. And I thought, oh, I'll work in tropical agriculture and I'll help feed the world. And I had big ambitions at the age of 18. So I went there. And actually, the University of Wyoming botany department was fairly small, but really well renowned. And I learned quite a lot in that department. From the University of Wyoming, I went to Oxford. From Oxford, I went to Ohio State. So I do have a link to Ohio. And I spent six years in Columbus with Brian Smith. And then after Ohio State, I went back to the UK and I got a job at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne in the north of England, where I was for 13 years, where I got to establish my own lab and learn quite a lot more about beekeeping. After that, more recently in 2018, I moved back to the University of Oxford. So I got a position there as an associate professor tutorial fellow in Hartford College and became a member of the staff there. And more recently, I've been promoted to a statutory chair called the Hope Professorship. So that's the history here from Casper, Wyoming to University of Oxford. And I kind of went in a circle. So I suppose I'll find myself back in the U.S. at some point. Hopefully not Wyoming. As I was saying, <laughs> I was at the University of Wyoming at the beginning of my academic career. I studied botany. The botany department there is very good. And there were a lot of physiologists. When I first got there, I was so keen. I went to their picnic and I was the first person at the picnic and I was coming to their departmental meetings and telling them I really wanted to be involved. So I was doing uh, research projects in the summer with some of the faculty there. And 
The person that really took me under their wing was Tom Vogelman. Tom Vogelman had a massive impact on me as a plant physiologist and a really lovely person, actually, and very smart. And I worked in his lab for several years, just doing a little project on how tropical understory leaves focus light into the photosynthetic layer of the leaf. But he was a friend, and I looked up to him so much, and he was a great role model for me. In addition, I couldn't decide whether I wanted to do botany or English, botany or English. So after the first year, I actually changed major to English, and then to cultural anthropology, and then back to botany um, over the summer. So I took the cultural anthropology in the summer, and I was like, no, no, this is not hardcore enough for me. I was really interested in mechanisms and explaining things, and physiology was really the way to go. Uh, but I tried a lot of different things, and I, I was very interested in insects. And the head of department at the time, Dennis Knight, was also my academic advisor. And he asked me, so what do you want to do in plants? What are you interested in? And uh, when I was uh, 15 years old, I was reading about medis medicinal plants, and that you could use plants as medicine, and I was really interested in that. So I told him plant-insect interactions is what I wanted to do. I was interested in chemical ecology and how that affected insects. And in talking to Dennis, I realized, actually, yeah, that is what I'm interested in. So I took an entomology class. And I'd always loved insects, like Sue. When I was a kid, I was out in the backyard collecting grasshoppers and you know, doing all kinds of terrible things to them. So I took a beginning entomology class with Scott Shaw. And Scott changed the trajectory of my life. He's about as tall as me. And he was at Harvard. And he's the director of the museum there. And he has a huge amount of enthusiasm. And so I spent a lot of time with him after that. I was in the lab with him, learning how to identify insects and classify them, I'd go to the field with him and collect stuff. And he helped me to actually do a placement, an internship in the Natural History Museum in London, which was really also a formative experience for me. These two people had a really massive impact on me. You know, when I was 20 years old, still very young, and you know, I'd never really left the state of Wyoming. They were supportive and they were my friends as well as people who I looked up to academically. So they really had a strong influence on me. Now, another couple of professors at the University of Wyoming also had a strong influence on me, Duncan and Janice Harris. They were both English professors and Duncan was my English professor in my first year. And they were like my parents away from home. They really were kind to me and always helped me stay on the level. And in fact, they both love mushrooms. And so when I took my mycology class in botany, I suddenly became an avid collector in the mountains outside of Larrabee. And I was collecting porcini mushrooms in the mountains and bringing it back for Janice and Duncan, who were English professors, but also uh, really loved Europe. I went with them to London on an exchange. So I had gotten a Goldwater scholarship while I was there because I was really interested in research. And that's a scholarship that was set up to support students who were interested in science. And when I had that money, I could suddenly go abroad to do a study abroad, and I was really keen. And I went to London with them for one semester. And during my time in London, I also worked in the Natural History Museum. So this is me at the age of 21. And these are two really nice people who I knew, Andy, and I think her name was Nicole, from my time there. And I spent a term just identifying insects and hanging out with the taxonomists. And I had these massive skeleton keys to get in and out of the museum at my liberty. And so it was a really fantastic time. But that was for one term. But during the time I was at University of Wyoming, I was studying plant physiology with Tom Bogeman. And I was really interested in these tropical plants. These are very interesting plants. This black area of this leaf, this is a common house plant that some of you may have. And it's in the Marantaceae, and it's a tropical understory plant. This area of the leaf, if you look at it, it looks like velvet. And it looks like velvet because the epidermal cells on the surface of the leaf are really conical. And that conical shape actually focuses the light into the photosynthetic layer of the leaf, like a lens. It really pinpoints it, so they make the most of the photons that they have in the tropical understory. And it's a really nice piece of work that Tom was doing there. These are the wasps that I worked on with Scott Shaw. So Scott Shaw was an expert in the Braconidae, which is a family of parasitoid wasps. And I was working on the microgastrinae when I worked with him. And I actually went to Costa Rica and did a small project in place where they do a lot of taxonomy and the characterization of all the insects and plants and other organisms in Costa Rica. But I did that at the end of my undergraduate degree as a result of Scott Shaw's help. So that's me. Now, you might have a glean that I was quite ambitious. <laughs> I was desperate to get out of Wyoming. I was trying everything I could to figure out how to get out of there. And when I first started at the University of Wyoming, Duncan told me about the Rhodes Scholarship. And I was like, well, yeah, maybe no. And because Rhodes Scholars, they like do all this stuff. They're like 
they're doing sports and they're doing politics and they're doing this and they're doing that and they have the CV that's really long. And I did a lot of things, but I didn't want to just spend my time CV building and I thought, oh, they're never going to pick me anyway. But he convinced me to apply anyway in the fall of my junior year, I guess. And I applied and somehow I managed to get through both of the interviews and they picked me. So I won a Rhodes Scholarship. And at the time, I was the first woman from the University of Wyoming to be given the Rhodes Scholarship and only the third person from UW to ever be given a Rhodes Scholarship. So there aren't very many people in Wyoming. Most people that get given the scholarship are actually at Harvard, Yale, you know, Stanford. They're people that are really academically doing really well. And so, uh, but I somehow managed to, to convince them that I was worthy of this. And so I went to Oxford in 1994. And Oxford was a huge change for me, a really excellent time. So in the beginning, it was at Hartford College, which looks like this, has this really interesting bridge. Everybody that's a tourist that comes to Oxford comes and stands under this bridge, gets their picture taken. And it was right in central Oxford. And I picked this college when I was applying for university entrance because it was the first college at Oxford to actively to recruit students from state schools. So students that weren't necessarily from Eton or Harrow or had you know, private school education. And they were really trying to recruit from throughout the UK. And this was in the early 1960s. And so I was really impressed by that. They were also one of the first to admit women as a co-ed college. So I like that too. And they still have that remit. They still have the passion for that. For those of you who don't know, Oxford is a university and has all those sort of normal academic departments as a university. But it was one of the two first universities in the world. In fact, they like to say they're the first, but probably University of Bologna was a few years before. And it was set up as individual units that became what they called colleges. These colleges were buildings that had a specific set of scholars that were associated with it. So in the good old days, a thousand years ago, it, these were religious scholars of different sects of Catholicism, Franciscans and others. And over time that evolved, but the college structure remained the same. And the colleges house academics of all kinds, English, history, chemists, engineers, biologists like me. And they all have a sort of home within the college, which is their social sphere. You know, get fed and, and then we are part of departments where all the biologists from all the college throughout Oxford then work together. So college has you know, physicists and engineers and all sorts. And as a student there, it's great because you have all these other students, especially if you're a graduate student, you're a member of the college or an undergraduate. And you meet all these students from all these other degrees that you might not otherwise meet from your course. So it was really fun. And in fact, it was too much fun. <laughs> in my first year, I spent a lot of time just going to parties. <laughs> and it was great. So uh, it's a really great atmosphere for socialization. When I first came to Oxford, I studied with a guy named Martin Spate, who was allegedly doing tropical entomology. But I soon realized within a year that Martin was not actually very research active. And so I switched to a different group. And this group of nerds were all working on insects and insect nutrition. And so I had to diverge from my original intent to study chemical ecology and instead work with these people. And these were the two advisors of mine, Steve Simpson and David Robenheimer. Steve was a young professor then, uh, a lot of energy, very charismatic guy, knew a lot about locusts, had worked with Reg and Liz Chapman, and uh, he was interested in insect nutrition and physiology. And Dave Robenheimer was his student from South Africa, he was a really brilliant student and stayed and became uh, a lecturer himself in the department. And they're like the dynamic duo. In fact, we used to call them that, Batman and Robin, because they really were two minds greater than one. And they, in fact, developed a framework for studying nutrition as a result of their work on locusts, which is now being used to study nutrition in all animals, including humans. And in fact, now they've moved from Oxford and they're both now at the University of Sydney. And Steve is a head of the Charles Perkins Center there studying human obesity. And Dave now is working on primates. He travels the world to study primate nutrition to get an idea of how we evolve basically with the food we have and what humans actually need in their diet. So this is me as an adult with my own lab and we're at a conference which I organized on the geometry of nutrition. We try to do that every three years. And the premise of this framework 
is that we have multiple essential nutrients in our diet that we need. We need carbohydrates and we need a source of protein and we need a source of fats and other micronutrients. And the foods that we eat are a mixture of all of these things. And perhaps there are few foods which actually provide us with everything we need. And so, you know, as omnivores, we eat a lot of different things and we eat a lot of different things at different times, but we're still trying to get to one optimal value for carbohydrates and one for proteins and one for fats and these other things. And they were interested to understand how animals do this and what are the trade-offs they have to make when they're feeding in order to acquire the correct balance of nutrients in their diet. And you can see here, this is a slide that I made. This gives you a little bit of information about your diet. So you can take this away with you from this talk later on. If you were just to eat pasta all the time, there's protein in pasta. There's not very much protein in pasta. It's about 6% protein. It's mostly carbs in this particular plate of pasta. There's a lot of fat. Steak, on the other hand, is about 24% protein, 19% fat, and no carbs at all. So you wouldn't be able to get any carbohydrates from there, but you could metabolize fat to make energy if you need. So you can see that the ratios of the protein to fat in both of these different foods and the ratios of protein to carbohydrate are very different. Now this might be the perfect food, right? <laughs> you have carbohydrates, you have fats, and you have protein, possibly in a good balance. But the, the interesting thing about this framework is that you can basically track animals or people over time and study what they choose to eat. And from that, deduce what their optimal nutrition is. And this is a really useful way of studying an animal's nutrition because you can get them basically to show you what they really need in their diet. They did this with locusts to start. So they were working with the desert locust, which eats a lot and it has a pretty high demand for protein. And you can see here, these are the two axes. If you were to graph you know, the behavior of the animal over time, and you give them two different foods that have different ratios of protein to fat, and then you track them. You can see in their first meal, they eat a lot of this, and then in the next meal, they eat a lot of this. So they zigzag between these two, pasta, steak, pasta, steak, right? If you think about your own diet, you know, maybe see this pattern. And ultimately, what you are able to measure is the optimal value for this, which they named the intake target. This is a really useful framework. Likewise, there are some animals which are confined to eat only one food. So a lot of insect herbivores are specialists and they only eat one plant or very few plants. And so they're confined to a food that may not be optimal for them, but they have mechanisms and they've evolved mechanisms that permit them to be able to use this food. And they also studied that situation where you have an animal that is confined to one food where they basically have to just eat this ratio of protein to fat to try to understand the kinds of trade-offs the animals have to make get to their intake target. So in this case, they're eating, eating, eating until they get a certain amount of carbohydrates and then they stop. And in this case, they're overeating carbohydrates to get the right amount of protein. And this is quite useful because if you're studying like human diet, if people eat diets that are too high in fat and carbohydrates, they still have a demand for protein that they have to get met. And so it's likely that you overeat these compounds to get enough protein in your diet. And what do you do with those things? So your body is really good at conserving nutrients. It was really important for our survival that we did this. We put on weight because we don't want to lose that nutrition. We're going to keep it so that we can survive you know, going forward. But the problem is with our modern diets, where we have highly refined sugars and lots of fat in diet, things we like to taste, right? Because, they, you know, again, um, we co-evolved to taste those things because they really helped us to survive. Then in our rich diets, we wind up putting on too much fat just to get our protein needs met because the balance of protein to fat and carbohydrate in our diet isn't really matching what we needed. So that's a little bit of insight. So this was very useful to me. You can see where this is going in my career. I didn't see it then, but I've definitely benefited from this now. And in my PhD, I studied this weevil in the field in Costa Rica because I still wanted to do chemical ecology. And I collaborated with a guy named Phil Stevenson at the time, who actually also has played a pivotal role. But I'd also studied grasshoppers and I did some work using different starch mutants of Arab Arabidopsis thaliana to find out how grasshoppers regulated their intake with respect to carbohydrates in diet. And that was me graduating. And at the time, I didn't know what I was going to do. I really wanted to go to work with this guy because this was a new institute, chemical ecology. It was like, oh. Oh, this is going to be great. It was fantastic, you know, just starting up and went there and interviewed with him and he, you know, verbally offered me a job. And then three months later, he took it away. And I had no money and I had no job and I was at the end of my PhD and I did not know what I was going to do. 
And, you know, I know part of this lecture that I'm giving today is to give you some insight into my background. But it's also, you know, to talk about the things that happen to people during their academic careers, which are not necessarily so good. And this guy really shook my confidence. Um, I really wanted to go there. I thought that this was going to be it for me. And he offered it, and then he took it away, and he really shook my confidence. And I think that he did me a huge favor, actually. He did us both a favor because I realized post hoc, hearing other people, especially women who had worked with him, he was extremely hard to work with, and that he ruined their careers, more or less. And also, if he hadn't rejected me, I would not be working with bees, and I would not be standing in front of you today. Or maybe, who knows how the world goes. But this was a major juncture in my life. And you know, it's true for most academics, the jump from PhD to postdoc is big, and then the jump from postdoc to academic is even bigger. And this was going to determine the direction of my career. This decision was really important. As a postdoc, you have to really you know, put the pedal to the metal if you want to make it as an academic. So this decision is quite key. And because he was not going to give me a job, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was in the Department of Zoology at Oxford, and I was waiting for the elevator. And Steve Simpson comes ambling along, and he's got somebody in tow with him. And this person was Brian Smith. And it turned out Brian had just gotten a big grant, a couple of grants actually, he had loads of money and he was interested in postdocs. And he, Steve introduced me to Brian and I said, hi. And you know, he asked me how the job search was going. I was like despondent. And Brian piped in, oh, I've got money and I'm interested in postdocs. Would you be interested in coming to work with me? So I said, yeah, sure, whatever. And I thought, ah, you know, Ohio um, and these. <laughs> but th this was just a small insight too. At the time that summer, I'd actually picked up a used book on beekeeping. And I thought, I'll buy this book because this might be something I want to do when I retire. I'm interested. I can start reading it now and then maybe later. <laughs> but I was getting involved in bees much faster than I knew. So I took this job with Brian and went to the Department of Entomology. That's Brian in, you know, with those pictures that Sue showed you yesterday. It was the same day. Brian rocks up. He saw us putting on this bee bikini. He's like, I want to do this too. So he just walked in, <laughs> got covered. He got stung and I did not. So the experience of actually the financial instability of coming out of my PhD, where I was a little bit in debt, I was actually a lot in debt, and I had no job, and I was basically dumped back in Wyoming at my mom's house, really also gave me a little bit of a reality check. Like I was always, this, you know, wanted to be an academic and you know, didn't worry about money, even though I didn't have any, and I was like, I'm just going to do what I want to do, and I'll you know, suffer along the way, and everything will be fine. But those experiences actually really focus my mind. <laughs> when I came to Ohio, I was like, we're going to get some work done here. No more partying. And I decided that I was going to part-time do a degree in statistics because I needed to have a fallback. If academic life wasn't going to work out for me, I needed to get a job. And I knew that statistics could get me the right job. So for the first three years I was at Ohio State, I was a postdoc. And I was also doing a statistics degree part-time. And I was doing this you know, the whole time. Every weekend and several evenings, I was studying. So it was, and it was very hard. I learned a lot and I somehow made it through that time, but it was, it was not easy for me, but I'm glad I did it. I certainly did pay dividends, for me. although I was a nervous wreck after three years of doing this. And during the time I worked with Brian, and especially in those first few years, what I learned about was bee learning. And Brian's an expert in olfaction and in the olfactory system of bees. And he was really interested in the bee brain and he had some money from the defense department to study olfaction, to see if bees could be used as bomb detectors. He had money from the NIH to study the olfactory system and behavior. So I was employed to do this. And I learned about putting a bee in a harness and training it to learn to associate food with odor, with floral scent. And in fact, what Brian wanted me to work on was to understand the chemical ecology of pollination, to understand how floral scent actually was used by bees to learn and remember the food quality that was present in a flower. And so I learned this technique where you deliver an odor, you feed them with sugar, and then very soon they learn to extend their proboscis. It's a type of Pavlovian conditioning. And it's actually a beautiful assay. You can collect loads of data in a very short time and learn quite a lot about what bees learn and remember. And they're fantastic, especially the foragers, at learning and remembering information. So this was great, and I loved it because during my PhD, I was really struggling to get enough data to actually have a PhD. And in this lab, I could generate huge amounts of data in a short time and publish papers. So I learned to appreciate it. And one of the projects that I did there was in collaboration with Natalia Dudareva at Purdue University, where I was interested in the scent of snapdragon flowers. 
And she was characterizing the different floral compounds that were found in these four different cultivars of snapdragons. And what I did is I wanted to see whether bees could differentiate these four floral scents because they're quite similar. They all have all the same compounds and yet they smell quite different to us. So I wanted to see, you know, could bees also differentiate these scents based on these floral scent profiles? It was one of the first studies of its kind, actually, because we're looking at quite a complex stimulus here with different compounds and different concentrations of each of these compounds. And we wanted to know again, how does this form an olfactory percept? And what I found was that bees were able to, of course, differentiate these floral scents quite easily. And in fact, there were two of the different cultivars which they were easily discriminated from the others. And these two, they actually had a harder time discriminating. I'm not going to go through and explain all the science here. I just want to give you a little taster of, of each of these different things I did. Uh, but if you're interested, come and talk to me. I went on to study this in greater detail. So in three years after suffering through the statistics degree, we did this bee bikini. And I had also gotten a fellowship at the newly formed Mathematical Biosciences Institute at Ohio State University. And this institute is still at Ohio State. And it was a great and really interesting time. And during that fellowship, I was interested to learn more about the neurophysiology of the bee's brain. So I learned a bit about how to record from the brain. I wanted to understand how odors were coded by the brain because it was a super hot topic at the time. Um, it was before Linda Buck and Richard Axel had won the Nobel Prize in olfaction, and loads of people were piling in trying to figure out how olfaction worked. So at the time, that's what I was doing with bees. Unfortunately, honeybees are not a very good model system for this because trying to record from them is very difficult because they die quickly. It's something like a cockroach or a locust, they're really tough. They're like a tank. They have a hard exoskeleton, big brain. You, know, you can perfuse a brain with lots of saline and the thing will stay there for six hours. Honeybee's so fragile, you set it up, you spend all this time cutting it open, doing all this stuff, and it dies. And you spent two hours trying to prepare your animal for a recording and then you have nothing. So it took me quite a long time and I didn't get very far, but this was a really good time for me. I learned a lot. Yeah, that was a good time. Bees are really hot and I'm sweating like crazy, but it was a really great experience with Sue. And in fact, during the time that I was in that lab, you know, Sue was our keeper and doing her carnival and, and I learned a lot about bees just from her while I was there. And in fact, her friendship has really been important to me and to my career. So this is a drawing of the bee's brain from Snodgrass. And again, I'm using slides from that time. I didn't update them, I just copied them. And I was interested in the antenna lobe, which is the area where odors are encoded in the insect brain. And I was trying to make recordings from this very complicated network there. And it was not easy. And we were using these massive electrodes too. That was another problem. The electrode was way too big for the bee brain and for the antenna lobe. And so I really didn't get very many good recordings, but I learned anyway. And I started working with Mark Stopfer at the National Institute of Health. And this is some of the data that I did generate during the time I was at Ohio State. Uh, where I was stimulating bees with these different odors and then recording from several neurons in the antenna lobe. Now, even though I was not successful as an olfactory physiologist, I learned an awful lot about neuroscience and about coding and trying to analyze data of this kind, which is what I was trying to do in the Mathematical Biosciences Institute. And that has actually really paid off for me now because my lab now studies the bee's sense of taste and while I'm a terrible electrophysiologist, I'm actually quite good at looking at data, writing about it, and understanding how to analyze it. And so I'm working with some postdocs who were electrophysiologists who've done some really nice work on these sets of taste. In 2005, I started looking for jobs. I was like, I've been a postdoc for five or six years now. I need to get out of here and I need to do something for myself. And I, it's either make or break now. And in fact, I'd applied for a fellowship to an NIH fellowship, and I got it. At the same time, I was applying for jobs. And this fellowship, I was going to go to the NIH to work with Mark Stopfer and carry on working with Brian Smith. And instead, I took this job in Newcastle upon Tyne in the north of England. It was the first job that I got. And in fact, I got it in a sort of strange way. I'd applied for these jobs, didn't hear anything. And then I got this email out of the blue just before, or just after the 4th of July, where they wrote to me and said, are you coming for this interview? And I was like, what interview? They'd sent me a letter by post, and so I got it after the email that they sent to me. And the, the Tuesday is when I got their email. Friday was when the interview was. So <laughs> I said, okay, if you'll pay for this flight, I'll come. So I bought the flight, and I was leaving on Wednesday. And I didn't have a talk, so I'm like working like crazy on this talk. And there was a storm on the East Coast, as <laughs> and all of the flights were being canceled because of the terrible weather. 
So I got stuck in Newark, New Jersey, and they finally got me on some other flight, and I was flying overnight, and I managed to get into Newcastle upon Tyne at midnight on Thursday. In the meantime, I had my computer in my backpack, and I was waiting around for the flight, and I put a drink bottle in the backpack, and the lid was not on very tight. So the laptop got covered in the drink, and it didn't work. So I had no talk. So I was in the hotel room in Newark, setting it in front of the air conditioning unit, hoping that it would dry out. And it did, it dried out. So I was able to carry on working on the talk on the way. So uh, somehow I managed to deliver this talk at 10 a.m. on Friday morning, British time, which is, you know, five hours ahead. And I had, of course, not having had any sleep at all. And I gave this talk and then I did another interview later in the day. And then I was going back to the hotel room there at seven o'clock at night. A good friend of mine from graduate school was living in Newcastle there. And so I'd gone and had a beer with her. I went back to the hotel. The phone rang as I walked in. And it was them, and they offered me the job the same day. I didn't really think about whether I should take that job or not. Now, looking back, if I had just, you know, had a little more savvy about what I was going to do with myself, I might not have taken that job. But I just told them, yes, I'll take it. And so I committed myself, and uh, I went. So here I am, and this is in the field outside of Newcastle upon Tyne. That was my lab there. They did have a very nice lab space for me, big lab space. And they renovated it and they set it up for me to do lots of bee training. All of these are like uh, air hoses to suck air out of a training station for olfactory learning. And you can see I had it set up for eight of those stations. So you can train a lot of bees that way, a lot of undergraduates. And that's how I started. I didn't have money for the first five years that I was there. So I was doing a lot of the work myself. I was teaching on a field courses. I was teaching animal behavior and eventually plant insect interactions there. I was working with students and I had undergraduates in my lab in the summertime. And the undergraduates were helping me collect data for these different projects. And so I was publishing papers bit by bit, but also doing a lot of the work. And eventually my lab grew. And as things went on, I was working on different things. I started working on the bee sense of taste as well as olfaction. I was really interested in chemical ecology. And so I started trying to look at how toxins in food might influence bees and whether they could taste toxic compounds that might be in nectar. I started doing more research in the literature to find out, you know, can they taste some of these compounds that are found in plants and do they avoid them? And I was still interested in mechanisms and learning and memory. And I thought, oh, maybe I could study addiction. This was something that actually I'd started at Ohio State with Julie Mustard. And so we started looking at drugs to see how that influenced learning and memory in bees. And I also started in bee nutrition. But before I get to the nutrition bits, one of the questions that I asked was, and this was an idea that I actually had in Ohio, because uh, I was reading about latent inhibition, which was the mechanism we were studying with Brian. And I saw these psychology papers in humans about the effect of caffeine on you know, learning and memory. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Yeah, maybe I should study that. And Brian was like, no, 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 this is, this is silly. So I put it on the side, but I came back to it. And it came back to it because there was a paper published that reported caffeine in the floral nectar of citrus plants. And I was like, oh, this is very interesting. Why would it be there? A lot of these compounds like caffeine that we use as drugs are actually toxins or poisons that plants produce to try to prevent insect herbivory. And so it, it didn't make a lot of sense. Why would caffeine be in nectar? Nectar is a reward for bees. Bees should be going there to collect nectar. Why would there be a toxin? So it was an interesting question from multiple angles. And so I was interested to pursue this. And um, to really study it in earnest, I needed to know more about the concentrations found in nectar and in what plants they might be found. And the obvious one was that, hey, why not the coffee plant? But nobody had studied the nectar of coffee plants or looked at caffeine and its possibility for other parts, floral parts of the plant, only the beans, right? And also the roots and leaves. So I got a small grant to go to Costa Rica and I collected some nectar from lots of different types of coffee plant in nectar, and I brought it back and analyzed it. And lo and behold, there was caffeine in the nectar. And I did this at the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew with my friend, Phil Stevenson. And this is the amount of caffeine in one cup of Nescafe and the concentration that you find per unit. And this is the nectar of these different coffee species, so Canephora, Liberica, and Arabica. And then these are different citrus species that I also sampled in Crete. And you can see there's a broad range of different concentrations of caffeine and nectar, and it's quite curious. So we were excited by this. This means there was really something to this and that it might be interesting to study it in bees. And we used that assay that I showed you before where bees were trained with an odor and with food. And this time we put the caffeine in the nectar as if the bees were learning about the floral scent that was produced by the plant. And what we found was that the bees actually learn faster and remember longer when caffeine's present in the nectar. 
And this is the control. So this is their response to the floral odor that they were trained with about 10 minutes after they were trained. And this is their response to that same floral odor the next day. We can see only about 20% respond out of the whole population the next day. But if you add caffeine to the nectar, everybody responds just as well as they learned. Um, so this was a really interesting and, and exciting result. And we published it in science and it got a huge amount of press. Everybody was interested in it. In fact, it even inspired work in humans where people were studying short-term memory and learning. And they found the same thing that people who have an acute dose of caffeine prior to learning a, a task, they actually are better at learning and remembering. So it, that was really fun and very exciting. Something else that evolved from this work, actually because I was working on this at the time and I kind of, you know, the lab was set up to do it, I had actually gotten some funding to study um, pesticides. I'm going to come to this. But neonicotinoids were starting to be used around the world to uh, protect all kinds of crops, including oilseed rape, which is canola, which is visited by bees. People have measured it in the floral nectar and pollen, and they realized that it was a potential danger for bees. And my lab was studying this, so we got some money in collaboration with some other folks. We wanted to see, you know, how does it affect behavior? And what we found was that actually bee honeybees can't taste neonicotinoids in nectar. These, these compounds are like nicotine, but they're present at such low concentrations that you can't taste them in a sugary solution. What's more, even when we added a huge amount of the neonic, they still couldn't taste it. So interestingly, they just don't have a mechanism for detecting a toxic compound in a sugary solution like nectar. But they're attracted to foods that contain them. So what we did is a choice assay where we gave them a food that contained sugar and neonicotinoid, or just sugar. And we found that the bees in a box that were given this choice were more likely to choose to drink solutions that contained dimatocloprid and thiamethoxam than they were the control solution. And when we saw this, we were like stunned. What, what is going on here? But the truth is that these compounds do act like nicotine. And what they're doing is they're activating certain pathways in the brain, which are responsible for the encoding the value of food rewards. And so they're making the bees think that this food is more valuable than it actually is. Just like nicotine does for us, gives us a kind of hit, makes us, it's rewarding, makes us feel good. It's doing the same thing in a bee brain, which is quite alarming because neonics, we know from loads of other people's work, are harmful to bees and cause bee colonies to go into decline and to die. That was a quite a stunning result. And we got a paper in Nature, amazingly, from that. The reason I started working on nutrition was that I finally got a grant. This was the first grant, really big grant that I got. And it was a consortium of people. So I got a lot of money. That's the long and short of this. I had met Sue Nicholson at a conference in South Africa. And Sue has been working on pollination and pollinator biology, in particular, the quality of nectar and pollen. And she was keen to apply to this funding source because it was open to people from outside the UK. And so she talked to me about it and she encouraged me to do this. Even though I wasn't working on nutrition, I was like, oh man. And I've been trying to get grants and I was getting really frustrated. You know, five years in, this is really what make or breaks your career as a young academic. And I just tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed. And then with Sue's help, kind of assembled this consortium of people. Sharoni was a good friend of mine from Brian Smith's lab, actually, who he set up his own lab in Israel, and I knew he was working on nutrition. Then I invited Steve to help, and Annie Borland, who was a plant physiologist, studied carbohydrate chemistry in plants at Newcastle, Dave, and Christian Perk, who was also in South Africa. And Phil Stevenson, who's like my partner in crime, it was Phil who measured the caffeine in the nectar. You know, it was Phil who got me through my PhD and helped me measure chemicals in plant leaves. And it's Phil today who's helping me do some of the most interesting work of my career. So without Phil, really, I wouldn't have much of a career. But we got this money. It was a consortium of funders, and we've never looked back. And this money was to study this question. Can bees meet their nutritional needs in the current UK landscape? And there was three parts here. One of them was to collect nectar and pollen from lots of plants and analyze it for the amino acids and the carbohydrates found in it. One of the aims was to study how bees regulate their intake of protein and carbohydrates using the geometric framework that I described to you. And the third was to look at learning and memory and foraging. We never really got to the foraging bit. We just focused on the other two bits during the course of this work. And a huge amount of very interesting information came from this work. So I have these beautiful data sets, some of which I've not published, but which are hopefully coming out this year or early next year on the amino acid profiles found in nectar and pollen. So nectar has one source, right? And it's full of sugars, but it also has amino acids. And pollen has protein, fats, vitamins, and minerals, which are important for bees, but we really didn't know what their nutritional optimum was and how they met these needs through these materials. So that's what we set out to study. I'm not talking about this in today's talk, but I will be speaking about it in future talks, at least this year in the CSBA. This is the profile of amino acids found in the floral nectar that we sampled in the UK. And 
we did this also for the pollen. And we now know how this profile actually influences the feeding behavior of bees and why it's not optimal for bees. So stay tuned. In 2016, I actually presented this to the American Beekeeping Federation and I gave a talk there. And I was comparing what was found in bees with the predictions of de Groots, what was in bee bread, and what was in all these different pollen subs that were fed to bees in terms of their amino acid profile. What we found was that actually these are quite different to what is actually in bees. And the American Beekeeping Federation liked it so much that they gave me the Hoopengarner Award for this talk that I gave. Sharoni did some really excellent work on the fatty acids found in pollen and their influence on bee learning and memory. And what he found was that if you don't have the right fatty acids in the food that you feed to your bees, and in fact, the right proportion of two essential fatty acids, omega-6 and omega-3, what happens is your bees are not smart enough. In fact, it affects brain development. And so bees that are fed with diets that are too high in omega-6 actually don't perform learning and memory assays very well. Lots of people have gone on to recapitulate this now. So we know that bees need omega-3 and they need diets that are relatively at least balanced with respect to the quantities of omega-6 and 3, but they do even better with more 3 than 6. So this was Sharoni's contribution to this. And again, we've gone on to study this in great detail. And we now have a grant which is running at the moment to understand the lipidome of the bees. So all the lipids in bees and how the lipids found in their diets and in pollen are incorporated into their body and how that then influences all aspects of their physiology. It's going to be really exciting when we actually start publishing it. So another thing that my lab has done over time is that we've really refined this assay so that we can study the macronutrients found in the food and understand how they balance their intake of nutrients. Um, and we use this sort of rearing cage that was developed in Sharoni's lab where we can put 30 bees in a box and we feed them with this diet and measure how much they eat every day. And we've done this now with fats and with proteins too, and we just published this recently. And this is just a graph from some recent work that we did where we show that the amount of fat in diet influences the amount of fat in the bees. So if there's proportionally more fat in the diet, animals also get fat. And what's more, the quantity of protein and fat, or the ratio of protein and fat, actually influences the total amount of food that bees eat and the ratio of food that they eat. So when the diet is relatively rich in protein, they eat more of the food and they essentially change state. And so I was given this Hoop and Garner Award for the work we did on nutrition. This was 2016. There's been a lot of work since then. And part of this funding actually meant that I was going to beekeepers meetings more, and I was talking to beekeepers more. And I realized that there was a need for the research we were doing in terms of translating it into something useful in the world. So Rui, who's my beekeeper, we went to visit Pat. We did a huge tour. In fact, we visited Jackie too, and Rui even stayed with Jackie. And Rui was trying to find out more what the actual practices of beekeepers in California were. And that's Ryan, actually, I think. And so we were looking at how they were feeding these pollen subs and learning a lot, and it inspired us then to try to make our own food. So a lot of funders of scientific work are really pushing academics these days to try to translate their work to do something useful for the world. And so we developed a pollen substitute and we're trying to figure out how to commercialize it so that it would actually arrive with the beekeepers. Um, it's a really difficult process, I've learned. <laughs> and I wouldn't do it the same way that I have done it now. We're hoping eventually that we'll have some food that you might be able to buy, but it's really a long process and it's not very easy to commercialize things as I'm learning. But we tried really hard and we came up with this. This is how it looks. We found that actually we can make more bees with it. And we tried, of course, to optimize all these parameters so that we could look at brood production. Can we make more bees? Yes. We actually found also that we could reduce Nozema with it. We think the adults last longer, so they produce more honey. And we're trying to make it biodegradable so that there's not so much waste. I'm not making a pitch for my products because there is no product yet. <laughs> we'll see. It's very expensive to make. So we need to make it economically feasible for people too. And we're not there yet. Um, but this took a very long time. And so I don't have as many publications in nutrition as you might expect, given you know how long I've been working on it. But it's because I've had to focus on this. So at the expense of publishing, we did a lot of work in the lab where we tried a lot of different types of proteins and combinations of proteins, fats, and all sorts of things. We tried it in the field where we were feeding them in enclosures where we could look at the brood production and feed them with different things and then look at how the food that we fed them affected the brood production. And we tested lots of other things. And in 2018, I got this job back in Oxford. So I was doing all this in Newcastle, working with Israel, and then I got this job in Oxford. We moved back to Hartford College, bizarrely. So uh, the tutorial fellowship was housed in Hartford College. They're in having a great time. <laughs> and setting up the lab again. And then the pandemic came, 
and that slowed everything down. And there's a very prestigious chair in Oxford called the Hope Professorship of Entomology. This chair was sort of provisionally held by Steve Simpson, but not really. And it had been lying vacant for four years, and they were going to elect a new statutory chair of entomology. This chair was set up by Ellen and Frederick Hope, and they were very rich Londoners from the 18th century who loved insects. And they were insect collectors and natural historians, and they were collecting insects from all over the world. And they had this massive collection and nearing the end of their lives, they decided that they would donate this to Oxford. And Frederick Hope, who was an amateur, but he actually became quite a professional scientist. He helped set up the Royal Entomological Society and the Zoological Society of London. Um, he was a friend and teacher of Charles Darwin, and he helped set up the Linnaean Society. So it had a huge impact on biology in the UK. And they built the Natural History Museum as a result of his collection, the Natural History Museum in Oxford, which was the precursor to the one in London. And so they donated tons of money. They didn't have any kids. They did all this work. And it was him and his wife. She was also an entomologist. And they wanted their house, their collections. And they set up a chair, which established the Department of Zoology there in Oxford. It was one of the first zoology departments in the world. And this chair was the Hope Chair in Entomology. And that was the head of the department. And in 2021, I was given this title. So I was the first woman to actually be given the title of Hope Professor. And I was, of course, very proud. And so this is my lab today, full of undergraduates, postdocs, visiting scientists, and all sorts. And it's a really great group of kids that I work with and established scientists too. And we're trying our best to make the world a better place for bees. I was going to end this talk by talking about the youth social organization of bees. I'm running out of time. But there was a really influential scientist named Bill Hamilton. He came up with this. He actually was at Oxford. And he realized that altruism in animals co-evolves when relatedness of the animals times the benefits that they accrue from social living. It outweighs all the costs of social living. And so he was really able to explain how a bee colony actually evolves, because this was a huge conundrum for Charles Darwin. Altruism, he couldn't explain by evolution, but Bill Hamilton explained it, and it was using social insects. And I just want to leave you with this, you know, and this is just to help explain it, right? Usually when you have kids, right, you're, you're related to your brother's kids. These two are related by a 0.5 and his kid is you know, 0.25 related to Harry, right? So you have your own children and your own fitness and then you know, your family may help you, but your relative related is slow. But the relatedness of bees is very high. And that's one reason that they explain that this altruism could evolve. But it's highly variable. It depends on how many drones have actually made it with the queen. But the benefits of social living are also important because this is the product of the relatedness and the benefits that come from social living. And this organism, it is a super organism, has, you know, refines its food to a great effect, right? It has perfect food, royal jelly, it makes bee bread, it makes honey, it makes its fuel for flight. It creates its food from the food that it gets, which is suboptimal in the environment. It's through their work, they crush their children, they look after their children, they keep everything clean. They can collect and hoard and store food when there is no food. It's an incredibly adaptive organism as a result of altruism. And altruism is basically doing things for others, right, that are not necessarily only in your benefit. So it's something that we can certainly learn from bees is that this kind of living is a higher order, right? I mean, there are costs certainly to this, right? Most of the workers in this colony are sterile. They aren't having their own children. And yet they're all contributing to the greater good and forming this incredible society, which is accomplishing more than a single bee could. So it's really an amazing thing. And it's what inspired religions, and it inspired even business people for you know, decades and centuries and millennia. And just to end on a positive note, because this is a, you know, a group of women, right? it's for being diverse, it's about celebrating diversity, but in part it's celebrating women, that Together, we can do more than we try to do as individuals. And women, too, are resourceful. And as seen in a bee colony, right, that we're willing to cooperate. We want to do, to do more often. And we're often very altruistic, that we can support each other and help each other to form strong networks that can help us to improve all of society for everyone and to um, make major strides in the future in science. Now, the equality state is really not the equality state. I'm afraid to say. It was not an easy place to be a woman to grow up. It was actually very difficult for me to carry on there. And it's one reason I wanted to leave. But in spite of these things, right, my desire to learn and understand things has kept me going. And it's led me to the place that I am now. 
and you can do this. And what's beautiful about America and about a place like Wyoming was that I had the means to do it. I had universities, I had high schools, all of these things which contributed in helping me to become who I am. So this infrastructure is vitally important to supporting you know, fairness so that all people have a chance to actually realize their potential. And that's what I would like you to take away from my talk today. Thank you. I don't know what to say. I'm glad her journey was so easy. And I'm glad she gave up so many times. And is this motivational or what? <laughs>